All right, we got that one on here. All right. <clears throat> As Ked Whalen was down here, uh, we had gone out to a dinner, and he was in the restroom, and this little nine-year-old boy, little little uh, uh, black boy, he's in the restroom with uh, you know Ken, and he um, looks at Ken and he says, um, "Hey, who's your favorite black person?" <laughs> and so. Ken, you know, he's, 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 old, he's older than me, and, and so again, he says, oh, this is a cherry little boy, and, and you know, he's, he's wanting to converse, and so Ken, Ken mentions somebody's name, he says, and that boy says, so what do you think about Jackie Robinson? And Ken says, wow, well, he was, you know, you know quite a man, and, and uh, you know, and they happened to sit next to us, and so we had a chance to talk to them a little bit, him and his family, but, uh, you know, we've all heard of Jackie Robinson, right? And uh, he broke the color line back in 1947 when he began to play Major League Baseball uh, for the Brooklyn Dodgers at the time. And uh, this was uh, when they had asked him uh, to step across to, uh, from the minor leagues up into the major leagues. Well, they coached him, you know, what's going to happen and, and you better be ready for it. And, but they specifically wanted him. And so he did. And you all know lots of that story. So he was the first one to cross over. Well, I, I want to look at a scripture here <clears throat> about the first, the first, very first non-Jew very first non-Jew, because prior to, to this guy getting saved, only Jews were right with God. Only the Hebrews, only the people, the sons of Abraham, right? And uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and so on. But all of a sudden, something happens where there's a non-Jew that gets saved. So let's uh, go ahead and look at this. And he happens to be a Roman Military captain of an Italian Italian uh, 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 regiment, and so the Roman army officer named Cornelius, a captain of the Italian regiment, he was a, a devout, God fearing man, as was everyone in his household, and he gave generously to the poor, and he prayed regularly to God. And one afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said, and Cornelius star stared at him in terror. <clears throat> what is it, sir? You could tell he was a soldier. What is it, sir? He's just, <laughs> and, and he asked the angel, and uh, the angel replied, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have received, have been received by God as an offering. Now, send some men to Joppa and summons a man named Simon Peter. And as soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants, a devout soldier, one of the, his own personal attendants, and he told them what, he, what had happened, and he sent them off to Joppa, of course, to go and get Peter. So here's a man, a centurion Roman captive, and so they, they feel like he was in charge of his, this, this, this Italian group of uh, probably 100 soldiers, and uh, he was stationed at Caesarea. <clears throat> but as we begin to look at this guy, Cornelius, we're talking about, and, and maybe you've heard the term Steady Eddie. He would, he would probably be the ultimate Steady Eddie. <clears throat> but let's look at him just a little bit more. Spiritually, this guy was spot on. Spot on. He did really big things by taking care of the smaller things that added up to now a big thing. The Bible calls him uh, a devout, God-fearing man. He's just a believer, despite the fact that he was not Jewish. He believed in the Jewish God. Now, everything and everyone that wasn't Jewish 
was considered a pagan to the Jewish people. Everybody that wasn't Jewish, they were pagan. And the Jews wouldn't even go inside their home. They wouldn't even so much talk with them. They had their own little world where the people of God. And so this was, this was the way it was in that day. And everybody else didn't know God, couldn't know God, couldn't be right with God. They had their idols. They had their immorality. Uh, and uh, they would worship themselves. Uh, but no, we, we worship the God of heaven. That's the way that just things were in that day. As in the day before Jackie Robinson. There was just this separation, right? The whites and then the blacks. But this man, the Bible says, was this, this uh, devout man. Now, now, that's a strong word, devout, meaning faithful, meaning fervent about what he believed. It wasn't just a flippant thought that, well, I'm, I'm part of this church, or I believe this, or I believe that. Uh, no. No, this is something that was down into his bones. Uh, he was fervent in what he believed and passionate about it. Uh, we could just say he was dead serious about his thoughts. This was not just an ideology. This is not just a, just a kind of thinking, but he really, all the way down to the very center of his heart, the deepest parts of him, he was a devout, God-fearing man. And so the Bible says, God-fearing, kind of threw that in here, God-fearing. So he knew there's something greater than I. <laughs> I can't see it, but it's there, and greater than I, and uh, he's put this world together. He calls the shots, and um, I believe there's a heaven. He's thinking, and... Uh, it's not that he's scared of God, but he has a reverence and respect for the creator of this world, the one that gave him his own breath. So this is what it means to be God-fearing. It doesn't mean that we're scared of God, like, like in that way. Now, you might want to be scared of hell. God doesn't want you to go there. But if you refuse heaven, there's no place else for you to go. So here's a man that was just very respectful toward God and, and reverent. And you know, one of the things that being respectful towards God is, is, is not, not trying to dupe God, not trying to get over on God, but to be honest before God, honest with yourself. And that's the way this man was. And this respect and this fear of God also was, is what drove him to want to try to do what's right, to try to be as holy as he can be without, you know, being an angel, just trying to do that. If he falls, he keeps trying. And so, so this um, uh, uh, fear of God is something that just made him so much better. He feared slighting God. He feared separation from God. Maybe he heard that God is a consuming fire as well as God's love, but he's also a consuming fire. He's both. So he had this, this um, very healthy respect, a holy fear for the living God. You know, the Bible says, and maybe you might ask, well, what does God want? What does God want from us? I mean, he put us here. He gave us breath. He built this world, beautiful world. And, and so, well, look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. What does the Lord ask? That you fear him. First thing he says, that you fear him in a good way, a godly fear. Walk in his paths, love him, and serve him with all your heart and soul. That's what God wants. Those, those very things But right at the top of the list was a fear, a respect for God. So this man, he was spot on spiritually. He really was. And he wasn't one of those guys that was a, a Sunday go to meeting kind of guy. Well, it's Sunday morning, honey, we probably ought to get up and uh, uh, you know, get the kids ready and put our church clothes on and do the God thing. And no, this, this wasn't that kind of a guy. 
Because the Bible talks about this man, as you read more about this story, that uh, he was a devout man, God-fearing, and yet it says not just him, but everyone in his house. That's telling. That's telling. You know, you wonder sometimes if there's uh, uh, parents that that, uh, that they're putting on the religious, you know, clothing and look and and disposition, you know, for Sunday morning. But, you know, as time goes on, you see their kids that are kind of like, I ain't into it, man. I ain't into it. You, you know, you guys go, I don't want to go to church. No, you're coming to church with us. And they're they're in the back, you know, and some and sometimes you wonder. I wonder how authentic their Christianity is in the house. It just makes you wonder. But to have somebody that has a house where everyone's saved, to have a, you know, a pops that has that kind of a, a, a fruit, that's very telling. Very, very telling. You know, it speaks well of Kathy and I when I tell people I got six kids and six out of six are living for God. They're all living for God. Never gave us trouble. No, Kimberly had a mouth at times. But you know, <laughs> six out of six. She's very intelligent. She just thought that she knew. And a lot of times she did know. <laughs> but uh, you know, but they're saved. They're all saved. They love God. And, and just, you know, so that, the Bible plugs that in here. Devout, God friend, but and everyone in his house. He had influence over. He didn't pass off uh, to the church. You know, the church needs to, you know, teach them about God. The church needs to reveal God to them and the family and, and no, but he took that responsibility on himself. Uh, as a father, <clears throat> no, I'm going to let my people, my children know about God, the God that I serve. I want them to serve the God that I serve. Uh, and Psalm 78, he took this to heart. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, that's the verse I just read, but uh, look at this one now. So it says, fathers, um, bring up your children in the instruction of the Lord. There's another verse I want to read. I missed it evidently when I was copying these over. It says these words, we will not hide God's work from our children. Psalm 78, 4. We're not going to hide it from our children. We're going to just bring this out. And, and again, the verse we're reading now is, is, fathers, bring up your children in the instruction of the fathers. Do that. He didn't say, hey, make sure you send them to Sunday school, to, to uh, you know, Bible camp. No. Fathers, you need to do this for your children. And it says, I think we just uh, read it. Maybe I had it backwards. Uh, uh, no. Okay. One more here. It says, touch. Or teach diligently your children and talk about God when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. And, and so it's just say, hey, just make God a conversation in your house all the time. All the time, just, you know, just be open about it. Now, I'm not saying you always have to talk about the Bible in every conversation. But just making a point here, just make it part of your life instructions and all about God and so this comes from God-fearing devout man but it doesn't just stop there he's spot on in so many different ways he's got the goods uh, goes on to say that he gave generously he prayed regularly this is not something that he had to do at a time and no but he just did that himself and uh, <clears throat> He had such an influence, not over just his family, but he was well-respected by the Jews. Same chapter, verse 22. It says those words. He was well-respected by all the Jews. Now, again, you have to understand Jewish people and the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, how they were looked at as pagans. <clears throat> so, here's a man that was stepping into uncharted territory and he had no map no map he's a gentile no map but he did have a compass within spiritual compass okay all i know is i want that god 
I want that God. And you know how to get there? There'd be a lot of things to go through. There'd be a lot of twists and turns to figure out, you know, what, you know how he's going to get there. But uh, so, <clears throat> and there's no doubt, you know, he's all by himself here uh, outside his family. But uh, there's no doubt as he's, you know, trying to do this thing, he's thinking, why am I doing this thing? Because every time he, you know, comes up, you know, with the Jews, you know, they're like, uh, uh, stand back, stand back. You're a Gentile, you're a pagan, you're a heathen. <laughs> we be the people of God. It's like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? But he kept going. Steady Eddie. Just kept going. And um, turns out he was just not only in the spiritual realm, he was spot on, but he was just worldly, well-rounded, successful, not just spiritually, but also in the world. You know, the Bible says Jesus grew in favor with God, but also, also grew in favor with man. <clears throat> well, he was much the same. He worked his way up to be an officer. <clears throat> no, he didn't do that by by. Uh, Rome sending him off and joining the military for four years of college. And, no. He fought hard. Fought battles. He fought hard and, and he acted wisely and he, uh, he was well disciplined. Uh, and so this man was just together and uh, worked his way up uh, and um, just a well-rounded, spiritually spot-on man. And so what happens here is God's now converging his will and it's coming to a point with this man God wants to open up salvation to the entire world outside of just the Jews now this is incredible incredible so God was impressed with Cornelius Midday, he gets this vision, a messenger from God that comes, and it's, it's an angel, and the angel knew his name, Cornelius. And the angel knew all about him. Well, Cornelius was surprised. And yet, God wanted Cornelius to know that all your efforts, all your righteousness, all that you, you're struggling against sin and, and yet you're trying to do right and, and your prayers, Cornelius, and your, your sacrificial giving. I see that you're giving to something that can't give back to you. You give to the poor. You just care. Now I, I'm, I'm seeing everything you do and um, Cornelius, I'm impressed. I'm so impressed. But did you know in the text it said those words? Your gifts and your prayers have made it up to heaven. That's the thing that really impressed God. Yeah. A lot that we do for God. Well, that, that, that's good. And God delights in that. He takes note of that. But he really likes our sacrifice, our prayers. Because when you stop and pray, you're stepping into the arena of that relationship and um, you're concerned about other people and you're also just demonstrating, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm not able to be what I need to be. I'm not able to keep my marriage together like it should be. And I, God, I can't, I don't have the wisdom as a father or whatever, you know? And so it just, when you're on your knees, you're talking to God, you're telling God, I need you. So these are the things that just so, so impressed God. So your prayers and your gifts, they're going to make their way to heaven. Now, I'm not talking about the two bucks you flip in the plate. Sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving. He's just a Roman officer. They didn't make a whole lot. Better than the normal soldier, but he's really, really caring about the people that are poor, about him. And so God comes to him with this angel and, and says, hey, there's a man I want you to go get. His name's Simon Peter over in Joppa. And so without hesitation, as soon as the angel, you know, 
departed, <clears throat> he jumped on the mission that God gave him. Go get this man, Peter. Send some of your men to go get him and bring him to your house. And uh, oh, without hesitation, he jumped on the mission. He didn't ask God, well, God, I need a sign like Gideon. It wasn't like Moses trying to dodge. Hey, uh, can you send somebody else? I don't want to have to deal with these Jewish people again. No. The minute the angel left, he called his men and said, hey, this just happened. And you guys need to get on it. Go to Joppa, get Peter, bring him back. And so as soon as the angel was gone, the Bible said he sent his servants. Hallelujah. So here's now this man that's just doing what he should do, staying at it. And God only knows how old he was. But for some time, I just have a gut feeling he just really gave himself and didn't see a whole lot come from that. It's hard all by himself. He's got his family that's following Jesus or, or not Jesus, but following um, uh, uh, kind of his path and his walk and, and uh, trying to please God. But then all of a sudden, it just comes to a head. It's like, bang, wow, an angel. And uh, go get Peter and What's this Peter guy going to tell us? And, and so now it's just like this whole new world is opening up to him. Well, let's go ahead and read. At the same time that God's doing something in him, through him, God's doing an amazing thing in this other town. At the same time, he's working on Peter, a Jew, but a saved Jew that uh, is a disciple and probably probably maybe the strongest disciple. Okay, so let's look at this now in Acts chapter 10, uh, same chapter. And the next day as Cornelius messengers went nearing the town of Joppa, Peter went up to the flat roof to pray and about noon and he was hungry and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance and he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by the four corners and uh, and in the sheet were all sorts of animals and reptiles and birds. Uh, and then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Peter declared, Lord, I, I've never eaten anything that's our Jewish laws have declared impure, unclean. But the voice spoke again, don't call something unclean if God had made it clean. And the same vision was repeated three times. So Peter's in a trance. He sees the sheet and all the animals. And God says, have at it, Peter. Just enjoy the food. Kill them, eat. Peter's like, hey, these are all unclean animals. And our law says we can't. And God said these words to him. Don't call anything unclean that I've made clean. So three times, Peter's like, what the heck is all this? about <clears throat> three times it came what's this mean well just as that happened there's a knock on the gate just outside the door and uh this is amazing and as they're knocking looking for peter the men from joppa got to his house they're right at the gate peter just had this trance and now the holy spirit tells peter peter there's three men out there, go with them, for I've sent them, go with them. And so, um, <sighs> Peter does, gets up, meets the guys, they spend the night, but the next day they make it back uh, to um, Joppa, uh, where, where um, Cornelius is, and, and Cornelius, he knows they're gonna get Peter, they're gonna come back. So Cornelius has all of his friends, all of his family, uh, many of his soldiers. He's got as many people there as he can possibly get. Uh, and finally, Peter returns and he walks into the room. Peter's a, a, a Jew now walking into the house of the Gentiles, right? This, you don't do that. You don't go there. When I first got saved, you know, uh, I was a heathen. I was wicked. and uh, uh, But I wanted to outreach. I wanted to tell people about Jesus. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we would outreach to anything that we 
possibly could outreach, you know, and wherever there's a crowd. Uh, and if there wasn't a crowd, we'd try to create a crowd uh, and we would tell them about Jesus. We'd preach to them or, you know, we were going to, uh, you know, uh, the rock concerts. We were going to basketball games. We were going Everywhere we could, we were just lifting up Jesus. But one night, man, we couldn't think of anywhere else to go but uh, where the prostitutes were. They had these little mobile homes out in the riverbed. And, and so we said, hey, let's go down there. And so we all went down there. It was like me and you know, four other guys. And so, you know, what, what we did is we, we walked in and all these prostitutes are just sitting there. We walked in and we started preaching to them about Jesus. And, oh, the guy comes out and says, uh, you, you guys can't do that. Go outside and, and, uh, uh, and say, well, we want to talk to the girls. And, no, and, and, if you want a girl, you got to pay for it. And they kicked us out. I got outside and I'm thinking, Pay for it. Hey, how much you guys got? <laughs> so we put our money together and <laughs> say, Rick, you do it. So I went, I prayed for a prostitute. She walks me up to the top. I said, mm, we get into a room. She closed the door and says, look, I got 30 minutes to tell you about Jesus. <laughs> Sat her down. She's like, you paid to tell me about Jesus? Yeah, 30 minutes. Have a seat. And so, and so she's like, I could see in her face. Well, she walked out. <laughs> the guy comes back and hands me the money back and says, Look, you can't do this here. So I walked out. I don't recommend that. All right. We don't do that kind of outreach. <laughs> but you see where our heart was. Praise God. Peter walks into a place in his mind. I can't go in there with them. But he walks in. He walks in and um, he says these words. It's the same chapter. Uh, you know, it's against our laws for Jewish men to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. First thing out of his mouth. Uh, I really shouldn't be here. This is a prostitute's place. And uh, I, you know, I shouldn't be here. But God has shown me that I should no longer think anyone is impure or unclean. That's what the whole sheet thing was. Oh, I can't eat. That stuff's unclean. I can't eat. God says, eat it. Don't call anything unclean that I've made clean. So... God has shown me no longer think that anyone is impure and unclean. I can certainly come into your house. And so Cornelius, you know, it's really intense to Peter to be in that position. Cornelius is like, okay, now this is new that you're in here and, and we're glad you came in our house, but uh, he wants to, to get to the point. He's saying, so we're all here waiting. Before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. <clears throat> now I got to thinking about this scripture. I thought, God, make us that way. Help us not to just come to church because it's church. To do our thing, sing the songs, do the prayer and the hand thing. Okay, and maybe the... But God, make us ready. Make us ready. We're waiting before God to hear the message of the Lord. We're waiting before God. Hallelujah. So um, Peter was surprised, just blown away that there were so many people to the point, right, right at the point of salvation, that God was preparing that he thought that could never be saved. So surprised, as Cornelius was surprised about the angel that visited him. Peter's surprised here. And, uh, and again, he says, uh, I see very clearly now that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. There's that word, that good word, fear again, of just a healthy fear and that do right. <clears throat> so even though He'd been told to go ye into all the world. Jesus told him, preach the gospel to every nation. 
he still didn't get it. But it was because of this man and uh, Peter's preaching his word. Uh, he just spoke the word of God to the people. And the Bible says the Holy Ghost fell upon them all, all the people. And they began to speak in tongues, to speak in uh, 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 you know, unknown languages. And, and it was an amazing, amazing miracle uh, of God. Hallelujah. So um, there's one thing I wanted to, <clears throat> ah, I guess I missed it here. I somehow deleted it. So here's this man, Cornelius, that had absolutely no the uncharted territory, remember? He did everything he did, God-fearing, giving, praying, devout, influencing his family, living for God. And yet he did that without any, not, not having any promise of being right with God. Of having no idea that he could have favor with God or that any benefit could come by him doing these things. He had no promise of even going to heaven. He just did it because it was just right. He did all that with no understanding of God. He didn't even know that God was a heavenly father. He had no clue about Jesus or having Jesus be the son of God. No insight about the Holy Spirit. He had no, quote, call that there's something that God would have you to do in your life. He's got a plan for your life. <clears throat> no, he had none of that. He just was a steady Eddie and at many times thinking, why am I doing this? And yet how much more we, how much more we knowing all that we know, there is a plan of God. There's an address that God has for your life. There's a will of God and people that he wants you to, to grow up alongside because they've got something to offer you. You got something to offer them and you got a given pastor that God wants you to uh, speak into your life. And, and there's so many factors. And so, and so we know so much. Now we can learn from Cornelius, can't we? Can't we? Just being a steady Eddie, no map, only the heart, the compass that he wanted God. And uh, this is pretty amazing. So let's bring it to a close. And um, so this steady Eddie, Cornelius, uh, eventually saw. Eventually it <laughs> was told that God take notes, that, that note of your uh, efforts and uh, uh, your choices. And uh, he was pleasantly surprised to know that God, the creator God of heaven and earth took note of him and wanted him to know that. And again, he was the first Gentile to convert to Christianity. His family and friends joined soon after that. And um, the kingdom doors, the heavenly kingdom doors swung wide open now because of this man to the entire Gentile world world everybody that didn't live in jerusalem or around israel in israel everybody could now know god isn't that incredible the great division between the jews and the gentiles was now fixed praise god jackie robinson he opened the door for so many others he took some shots it was hard. He, he went through a lot. Uh, uh, but there was something in him that he just wanted to do what was right. Many of you may not know uh, <clears throat> that Jackie Robinson was in the Army. Did you know that? And while he was in the Army, there's something in him where, you know, in those days, if, if you were black and a white person got on the bus, you had to give up your seat and go to the back as a black person. Well, Jackie Robinson, like, you know, uh, Rosa Parks, he said, no, this is before Rosa Parks. No, I'm not doing that. He was, in, he was in the army. 
they arrested him and court-martialed him. Did you know that? Yeah. Because he took this stand. It was just something in his heart. And uh, later he was acquitted. Thank God. But this man was chosen to play baseball by a specific owner of the Dodgers. Um, and, 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 and the reason why he chose Jackie Robinson was because of his demeanor. He knew this guy had to be such a quality of a guy that he would endure everyone else pulling him every which direction, mocking him and all these things, uh, and the mental and the physical abuse, but he couldn't fight back. He just had to be a steady Eddie. Just keep playing ball. Wow. <clears throat> and this man changed the game of baseball and athletics in America. It completely turned the whole uh, uh, attitudes of the American mind. Isn't that incredible? Like Cornelius, another steady Eddie turned such an incredible turn of events in fact you know probably one of the most famous men and 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 yes he had some problems but he was still a very 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 great man in many many ways was uh, dr martin luther king jr right do you know who inspired him to be who he was that went on to push you know, the segregation all the way to the hilltop and was a very, and gave his life for his cause. It was Jackie Robinson, his friend. Praise God. That took out of this man's life, his influence over another man's life that took another huge turn today to where now, People like me riding on a bus or a subway, and there's some, you know, some black lady that walks in. It's like, excuse me, uh, how about you take my seat? And I'll sit up and you know, have a seat. No, you don't have to stand. I'll stand here. Have my seat. Right? That's where we are today. Praise God. And that happened because of a steady eddy.